Beyond Numbers, Exploring the Actual Universe. Um, this first seminar today, or webinar, I should say, is going to look at the first stage of your path to come to an actuary. We are joined with four panelists. I'm going to explain who they are, who they are in a few minutes' time. Um, a very brief overview. We're going to be talking for maybe 35 minutes and about 20, 25 minutes Q&A. The outcomes from today is you should have a good understanding of what actuaries do. I'm going to talk about some generic themes around that, whilst you're going to get the actual experience from the panellists uh, later on. We'll talk uh, briefly about how to qualify the path where you become an, an associate and a fellow. And, and, and you know, the main focus today is that like the 20, 30 minutes or so, gaining the experiences from the panellists on on what they do for work, how they arrive there, and the opportunity then to do a Q&A session with them. So I should just say, my name is Mike Cannon. I look after education at the Institute. So first of all, I just want to give uh, an idea, uh, you know, what do we mean by actuarial? And if you think, many of you are doing your university studies, and if you think of some of the subjects that you're studying, you're looking at things like, well, What's the chances or what's the probability? Um, oh, sorry, somebody just a question already. Okay, um, if somebody can answer that, Louise, maybe. Um, if you think about your studies, you're often looking at events that may happen in the future, and you have to think of about the probability of that event occurring. And uh, if it did occur, is there some financial consequence? And also, how would you express that future value of money in today's terms? So in a sense, you're what you're doing is you're looking at the um, the consequences of a decision made by somebody to offer some sort of contract. Uh, so essentially, we're just summing this up today as actuaries advised on the consequences of decisions. And within the education curriculum, that's sort of like broken into three main parts. And the first one is that it was a very scientific approach we want to take to making decisions. Uh, and by that, we mean... Once you make a decision or given somebody advice to making a decision, if a peer or a colleague or somebody else asks you, how did you arrive at that? You'd be able to demonstrate, you'd be able to take them back from your decision to all the data and the methodology that you're using to, to come to that conclusion. Now, what you'll learn, not so much in university, but more if you do uh, uh, the fellowship subjects uh, post-university, is that you can't make decisions on your own. You're not a mathematician sitting in a room having complete control over yourself. We live in an environment ruled by governments. Uh, we have a code of conduct at the Actuaries Institute. Society has various expectations of how you behave and how you come to make decisions. So as actuaries, we tend to abide by very different governance, which sometimes conflicts with each other. And the final statement here is uh, what you should develop is an entrepreneurial mindset. And by that, we mean if somebody proposes something to you, you know, an appropriate response is not a very blunt no. It's more of a case of, well, if we adopted that, these are the consequences of that decision. So why don't we work together to alter what the question is so we can get to a better solution for whomever we're advising? And like this, the skills that you require. Um, clearly, lots of math skills. That's a necessity a necessity to be an actuary, but it's not sufficient. Um, the two main skills that we need in practice are the, the ability to think critically about any problem. And more importantly, is the ability to communicate your information to somebody else. When you're doing a piece of work, you're trying to sell your ideas to somebody else. The person who's going to buy your ideas will not really be interested in the mathematical explanation. They will want a very clear explanation in concise and complete sentences without using maths. And that's a huge skill that you should think about in your university days. We do help you during the associate, the actuary program with our communications paper, but also throughout the fellowship and in your work in life. To rise to the top, you really need to learn to communicate in English or whatever your local language is. How to become an, uh, an actuary or a fellow? I think many of you are aware of uh, this type of slide where you do some university subjects, the ones in the gray boxes on the end. You try to get some exemptions from them when you come to the Actuaries Institute. And then we take you to this program, the Actuary program, which you do with two units at university and a couple of units with the um, uh, directly the Actuaries Institute. 
I see a Q and A coming up. What I'll do is, is we'll, we'll we'll try and answer them later on. Um, and then you get to your fellowship program. There's a wide variety of choices, a wide variety of specialisations. So how do you choose them? It all depends where you work, what your interests are, what your employer is willing to sponsor. Um, and then finally, the the last exam you do is what we call an application subject, which covers. Three of them cover the traditional domains of general insurance, life insurance, and superannuation. But there's one called data science applications, which has proven very popular. And about 65% of our students currently qualify using that subject. Uh, finally, um, before I hand over, I introduce the panelists. I just want a, a very quick sort of 30 seconds saying that the Actuaries Institute has spent uh, a huge investment in terms of time and stakeholder management in thinking about an education system which suits uh, modern day students. So what we've done, we've really put your experience at the heart of our system in the post-university education system. So for those who come to us uh, to become a, uh, an actuary or uh, progress to the fellowship, we've designed our system to essentially create a virtual university to enable you to have a more smoother transition from the university world into the world of work and enter that pathway to become uh, finally qualified. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start by uh, introducing our panel of uh, four speakers. And the first speaker that I'm going to, oops, sorry, uh, introduce is, is Ben Howe. Ben is an actual analyst at Finity Consulting. He's a fellow who works in general insurance in Sydney. Uh, ben describes himself as a young actuary. He's just getting started, but he's had several work highlights. Um, been involved in building and applying natural peril models to help insurers understand and price their natural perils risk. He's developed or developing an algorithm to identify worker to worker claims for liability classes of business and a specific rating algorithm to price for worker to worker exposure. Working in CTP reserving. Uh, that's a class of general insurance business, which involves allowing for claims to transition from different categories as new information emerges. When asked to summarize himself in one sentence, uh, Ben says, he says, pretty day to earth, uh, enjoying learning new things and challenging myself. Now I'm going to hand over uh, to Ben. Awesome. Well, thanks, Mike, for that introduction. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name's Ben. Um, and as Mike mentioned, I work at Finity Consulting, where they're kind of a focus on general insurance. So I don't have any slides that I'm going to talk to, but I have a few high level points that I think we can just touch on and then feel free to put any questions that you have in the Q&A and we'll try to answer those at the end of each of the presenters' presentations. So why did I become an actuary? I would say I've always had an interest in business. Um, I've really enjoyed problem solving and I've always been up for a challenge. And so I feel like those things are fairly characteristic of actuarial work. So it generally just fitted the mold quite well. Uh, in terms of my path to becoming an actuary, so I recently qualified as a fellow last semester. So I went to Macquarie University. I don't know if there's any of you on the call who are currently studying at Macquarie. Um, and I graduated at the end of 2020. So during that time, I interned at KPMG and the Australian Government Actuary in Canberra. And for the last over two and a half years, I've been working at Finity Consulting. So the reason I chose my current role is because uh, during university, I actually volunteered as a firefighter. And Finity is kind of one of the market leaders in natural perils modeling. So I really wanted to get that traditional actuarial training, but be able to blend my practical experience as well. So um, I think each of the speakers are going to discuss different practice areas. So I'll quickly touch on GI. So what, what is general insurance and what sort of work that a general insurance actuary might do? So to kind of explain general insurance, it's basically anything that isn't life or super, <laughs> which is probably not a great explanation, but there's a range of different areas. So some of the most common ones would be property. These would be insuring things that you own, like your home or maybe your car for motor insurance. Um, there's also liability as well. This one you might not have heard of, but this is where if you injure someone else, then you're liable for the damages you've caused them. So there's a few classes there as well. Uh, in terms of the sort of work that a general insurance actuary might do, um, a lot of it, um, there's a lot of pricing. So that is how much are you going to charge the customer for the insurance cover? Uh, there's reserving. Like Mike said, the work that actuaries do, we look at um, un uncertain future outcomes. You know, the policyholder could claim or they might not claim. Your role as an actuary is to kind of inform the insurance company about how, how much money they should set aside to pay those claims. 
um, in terms of different practice areas as well. So you could have maybe personal lines products, which are products you sell to customers. So home insurance, you could have commercial lines products. So you might sell them to businesses. So you might have business insurance. There are statutory classes. These are classes of insurance that the government thinks are so important. They make compulsory like CTP, which I'm sure if a few of you on the call drive, then you will have CTP cover. Um, and then there's also some non-traditional work as well. So natural perils, which is looking at modeling weather events like bushfires and floods, and then data analytics has also been an area that's been quite prevalent recently. So in terms of the skills that are important for a general insurance actuary, um, as Mike mentioned, the technical skills are very important, and I feel like they're an expectation. All actuaries are expected to have that level of technical ability, so the strong analytical skills and really being able to understand all the detail going on. Um, and the soft skills, I think, are particularly important uh, because there's there's no value if you can't explain, you know, in detail in a way that your client or manager or stakeholder can understand the complexity of the work that you do. Like actuaries are trusted advisors and that's how you add value. Um, and then, sorry, I'll finish off. Uh, studying, I'd say study is quite challenging, but it's very useful. I found that it really like supplemented uh, what I did at work. And I felt that as I came towards the end of my qualification process, everything tied together quite nicely and really helped me answer what is an actuary and then the expectations that come with being one. So yeah, hopefully that gives you a little overview of GI and about myself and yeah, I hand back to you, Mike. Oh, thank, thanks, uh, Ben. So what we're going to do now, we're going on to, uh, well, we'll have time for Q and A. Uh, so please um, send some some into our box. Right. Next panelist is Peter Komenos, who is a senior analyst at Mercer. Uh, Peter is currently uh, at the associate level and he's he's works in superannuation in Sydney. Uh, Peter did complete a few inter internships whilst at uni and his studying to become a fellow. Career highlights to date, uh, finishing the actuary program, well done. Uh, successfully getting an actuary role in one of the fastest grown and impactful financial industries, superannuation. Um, I'm sure Peter will talk more about that in a moment. Helping to organize a conference for the young actuaries to exchange ideas. Uh, I'd like to just add there that uh, half our membership uh, are what we regard as young actuaries, uh, under 35. When asked to summarize himself in one sentence, uh, Peter says, I'm always striving to find the best solution. So thanks very much for coming, Peter, and we'll hand over to you to tell your story. Oh, good afternoon, everyone, and Mike, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm a senior actual analyst at Mercer, where I sit in the superannuation consulting team. Outside of this, I dabble a little bit into the life insurance team, as well as a little bit on our investment consulting side. But uh, in the short five minutes I've been given, or kindly given the floor, I'd like to chat to you a little bit about superannuation, actuaries and superannuation as well as finishing off with a little bit more of a personal note about my perception of uh, what actuaries are and how my perception of an actuary has changed over time. But first, a little bit about my uh, actuarial journey so far. In a similar fashion to, I'm sure, a lot of people on the call, my actuarial journey started out with some deliberation after high school, where I took the little bit of a risky jump into a quote-unquote hard degree of actuarial studies where uh, one of the first things that someone told me when I went into actuarial studies at university was, oh, you're doing actuarial studies. Unless every morning you're trying to model the rate at which your milk is absorbed into your wheat bix, you might be in the wrong place. Though I find this quote quite funny to this day, and it may or may not have some merits. I, do think it's, I don't think it's necessarily the right perception of what it is to be an actuary or work in an actuarial field. Um, but back to my journey. Uh, like Mike mentioned, I uh, did a couple of internships in university. One was in actuarial and one was not in actuarial. And by doing this, I really felt that I was a, uh, um, I could make a comparison between the two and see what I liked and disliked about either one. But um, sitting here in the from an Actuaries Institute perspective, I'm sure you can figure out which camp I landed in out of those two. But uh, a takeaway in hindsight out of doing those two internships is it really was more than just a more than just a CV stack? You could make an assessment of a potential industry that you wanted to move into in the future. So I uh, would say that's a, a absolute highlight of something which you could potentially do in university in an actuarial field. 
But continuing my journey, which has been broadly linear up until this point, it continues in that general direction where I went into a graduate role in the firm I'm currently with, which is Mercer, sitting in the superannuation consulting team. Um, but changing tack as well, uh, still sitting in that actuarial journey space is I'm undertaking the fellowship program uh, at the moment. And to Ben's point, it really does have ties to the work that I do and it makes my work easier insofar as I can learn a bit more background about the work that I'm doing and how to do it. But uh, seeing as I've still got two more courses left uh, in the next two semesters, I come to you more of an actuary as a little A, as one of the partners at Mercer uh, once called it. So on to superannuation. What is superannuation, you might ask? You might have heard a little bit about it in the news with things like a $3 billion cap applied to balances and some heated debate between politicians about things like, uh, can superannuation be used for public housing or can superannuation be used to fund venture capital? But being university students, it would be not unreasonable that you don't have too much of an idea of what superannuation is. So to demystify it a little bit and put into plain English, superannuation is money that you set aside uh, throughout your working career. And this is money which comes out of your paycheck at a rate of 11% and goes into a nominated super fund of your choice where this money is set aside until retirement, at which point you stop accumulating money. And this money then replaces your income after you retire, which is what's affectionately known in our, at least the superannuation uh, actuaries as the decumulation phase. So that's broadly what superannuation is. And a little bit of uh, the industry at the moment, the superannuation industry sits at three and a half trillion dollars of funds under management or assets under management where this is continuing to grow with the compulsory contributions of currently 11% and is expected to be one of the largest financial industries or the largest, sorry, financial industry within the next 10 years. So obvious question from there is actuaries in superannuation and what exactly do they do? Um, and actuary in superannuation really sits in both, uh, both camps here, the, the traditional as well as the non-traditional camp where in the traditional, it's mainly focused the more of an old school type of superannuation called the defined benefits, where it can be akin to a uh, appointed actuary in a life insurer or general insurer, where you're looking at the assets and you're looking at the liabilities, doing some modeling, projecting this out, and then making sure it's looking reasonable into the future. Where there's also the non-traditional side where it's using those actuarial skills that you have built up into things that are not necessarily uh, legislated that an actuary has to do it. So this is also called a, a non-prescribed uh, role, where uh, this is an absolute plethora of different ways that super, um, superannuation and actuaries, or actuaries work in superannuation in this non-prescribed area. But um, a couple of big ticket items that are going on at the moment are retirement income strategies, which is effectively saying, there's this really big balance that people have at age 65. How are we going to optimize people's income from there? And you can see there's obvious actuarial skills in there, which could be used as well as a bunch of other things where, for example, I'm working on risk-based capital management for super funds and a whole bunch of other things where the actuarial training really sets you up well. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on was the perception of actuaries and how my personal perception of actuaries has changed since starting university to where it is now. I mentioned the, the, the short quote or the quip of modeling your breakfast at the very start. And that really alludes to uh, actuary as being really focused on the mathematics and, and that's it, or the modeling and that's it. But that idea in my mind has evolved quite a bit since then, where it's much more than just the mathematics. I know uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times on the call so far, but it's much more than that. There's other skill sets which are also required in your, in your toolkit in order to be uh, a good actuary. And those are really communication, as well as our strategic thinking where you're communicating your results to people who are non-actuaries. So it has to be not technical and strategic thinking insofar as you've built up all these actuarial skills and complex financial uh, modeling and solving issues. And this can really translate into strategic thinking more broadly in a business. So I think I'm running on time there. So I'll hand it back over to, uh, hand it back over to Mike. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. So, uh, everybody's got a good understanding of the complexities of superannuation, also from Ben, the, the GI world. We're going to switch uh, industries now. We have uh, Joy Louis from a, a health fund, HCF 
based in Perth. So it's good, you know, we've moved out of Sydney all the way over the other side. Um, so Joy, as a fellow, works in, like I mentioned, in health insurance. Um, her career highlights, passing the fellowship exams. It is a huge relief when we get to that, that milestone. Uh, getting a promotion and salary increase. Uh, and Joy's getting positive feedback after completing a project. That's, that's, that's always great to hear. Um, when asked to summarize, a purpose-driven life. Sounds uh, nice, 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 and, and, and brief and to the point. Or I'd like to hand over to Joy, and if you can and take us through your uh, journey. Thanks very much, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. I'm very excited to share a bit about my actual journey. So, I'm Joy. I'm working at HCF, an actuary working at HCF, and HCF is one of the largest health funds in Australia. So. We also do, in addition to health insurance, we also do pet, travel, life, and overseas health cover. So I work in the health insurance team, but to date in my career, I've worked in consulting. So for uh, government and uh, general insurance, uh, uh, government, and, government and health clients. I work in general insurance and I've worked in health insurance. Um, and what I found is that skills are really transferable between industries. So your numerical skills, analytical skills, communication, you can just transfer these through industries. But of course, when you get to each new industry, you've got to learn um, industry specific knowledge. So why health insurance and why did I choose health insurance? Basically an opportunity came up and I'm like, let's give this a go. This sounds really interesting and different to what I've been working in. Um, and I've learned that actuaries have a very important role to play in health insurance. So essentially our system in Australia is a hybrid of public and private health insurance. Um, so the public system, which is funded by the government, by Medicare and the private system, which is um, covered by the private health um, hospitals, private hospitals run through private clinics, but um, reimbursed by private health insurers. Um, the private sector takes off a lot of burden from the public system. So it's important for actuaries to play, play a role in the health insurance uh, industry. So what do actuaries do in health insurance? So we do a lot of things. We do pricing. So how much you pay to get hospital cover. So how much do you pay for to get cover for your extras? So to see the dentist, for your chiro, for your physio and all that. And we do product development. So we find innovative ways to do different types of health products. Uh, what we also do is we do reserving. So how much money we have to set aside to cover hospital and hospital bills and dental bills and um, any medical bills that might arise. We also do things like projections. So um, for different financial indicators for like, you know, your sales, your claims, your lapses. Um, so this will help in your business when it comes to planning, it comes to um, what you want to do for the future. It's really helps for that sort of thing. And also, of course, we do a lot of reporting because health insurance is, especially for health insurance, it's very heavily regulated. So what I've done in my role in HCF and what I've done in health insurance is I support with um, analysis. So any analysis that's needed, it gives us, it gives the company a better understanding of what decisions they can have to do, like what are the financial consequences of those decisions and considering any other external factors. So an actual career I found to date is very rewarding in terms of um, variety of work, in terms of life balance. And the study that you do is very relevant to work and work that you do is also relevant to your studies. And I think from what I've taken away from my studies is the kind of mindset and the attitude like what is a key question, what I want to learn? What is the key takeaway I want to take from this session, this webinar or this chapter? And I apply that in my work. What is the key thing? What is the key takeaway I want to get from this project? What is the key learning? And you bring that kind of attitude and mindset with you all along um, your life because basically study doesn't just end when you finish your exams. You've 
um, it's always lifelong learning. You've got to not just build your CPD points, but having that mindset will help you to grow and learn and in, enjoy life all the way. So things like soft skills are so important in addition to your technical skills. Like, you know, you might have lots of great ideas. So you might have a lot of um, pictures in your mind or anything, but if you're not able to communicate them and if you're not able to express them to someone, what are the value of those ideas? And it's like having a lot of beautiful paintings in your mind, but if you can't paint them out or show them to someone, um, you're only going to appreciate it yourself. And the second thing um, is communications, uh, sorry, beyond communication is building great relationships. So if you have a great ability, like Mike's mentioned, you're not just not like a mathematician sitting in a room all alone. You have to work with others. You have to work with regulators. If you're working with others, it's way more powerful than working alone. Um, when you collaborate with others, there's a lot of opportunities. So um, in a nutshell, an actual career is very rewarding. It, it constitutes lifelong learning. Um, you bring that mindset with you and a lot of opportunities are open to you once you've um, got, gotten that experience and gotten that learning along. So um, what I just wanna say is just keep learning, keep going, keep exploring and yeah, I hope you have a really great time with your studies. Thanks. I'll return it to you, Mike. Oh, thank, thank, thanks, Joy. That was uh, great to hear again. Yeah, this concept that um, the profession is really uh, for those that are very intellectually curious and want to learn their entire lives and, and, and get better at that. A theme that's coming through very strongly is the communication one. Now, I'm just going to go to our, our fourth speaker, Biswash. Uh, Manika Dan, who is a senior actual analyst at the NDIS, or I should say the National Disability Insurance Agency. Um, it's actually an associate based in Sydney in disability insurance. Uh, Fishwash's career highlight is his current work, uh, working with his team to project the future expenses for the NDIA's disability scheme, ensuring that the scheme remains financially sustainable. Uh, for those in the audience, a few years ago when the NDIS was set up, the government was very much pushing this. This entire scheme has to be set up on actuarial principles. So this is a great thing that we're talking about um, traditional fields, first three. And now this is an example of moving into wider fields. And it's really great to hear the government thinking about we need a lot of actuaries in this type of space in order to make sure that the scheme is financially solvent in the long run. So uh, Fishwash, Fish when he summarizes himself in one sentence, is an optimistic individual that hopes to have a positive impact on this world. And with those words, I'd like to hand over to Fishwash to give us his story. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, firstly, I want to thank the Actuaries Institute for having me on the panel. Um, so I thought I'd start off and talk about the NDIS and try and provide a different perspective of the work that Actuaries do. So. It's quite normal that actually is working across insurance companies um, and you know, consulting firms that operate with insurance companies. And we often tend to hear about that quite a lot. But I think um, where the NDI sort of focuses itself is we sort of take the principles of what actuaries do and we apply it in a very different context in comparison. So it's sort of like taking what actuaries do and applying it in a different place. So I thought I'd just sort of spend a few minutes just talking about the kind of work that we do um, and how it can perhaps influence you in your career. So before we get into all that, I just thought I'd introduce myself. Um, so my name is Vishvesh, and growing up, I've always enjoyed mathematics. It's always been the favorite subject at high school. Uh, one of my favorite talks in mathematics was always probability. It was because, you know, back in high school, math, um, probability is quite easy, right? It's it's arguably the favorite part of everyone's time at mathematics. Like, uh, what's the probability you get a one when you roll the dice? Oh, it's one on six. Uh, th those kinds of questions are always easy. So I sort of grew a liking towards probability. Um, so I approached my uncle and dad while I was trying to find a suitable career. And I looked around and I wanted to find a career specifically in statistics and probability. It's predominantly, again, because those were the subjects in mathematics that I found the most interesting. Um, and well, behold, I ended up at Macquarie University where I studied to become an actuary. So I spent three years at Macquarie University doing my bachelor's. Um, I later got out and I started working at the NDIS where I've been here for about two and a half years. I also qualified as an associate of the Institute, and I'm currently pursuing the exams to um, try and attempt to qualifying as a fellow. 
So what exactly is the NDIS? The NDIS is the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which aims to provide reasonable and necessary supports to Australians that are currently living with a severe or personal permanent disability. The goal is essentially to sort of provide support to our participants so that they can lead a better life in the short and long term. It can sort of range from providing simplistic support, such as a wheelchair or something to sort of help the participant move around, um, all the way to more complex needs, such as modifying a participant's house or, you know, providing technological support such that they can lead a better life. The goal is to ultimately provide participants with more choice and control over their lives in the short and long run. We also firmly believe in early intervention. So we want to invest in our participants early on so that in moving forward into the future, our participants can help lead a better life. So the scheme is quite big. Uh, we have around 600,000 participants at the moment, and we're expected to have around 1 million participants over the course of the next six to seven years. Um, currently, the scheme's expenses are projected around $29 billion. Um, that's billion with a B. And that represents a lot of money for just a yearly expense. To put things into perspective, um, if you look at the gross liabilities of the entire general insurance industry, that boils out to around $42 billion. Um, I just, yeah, that's based on the APRA statistics. And if in comparison to Medicare as well, um, we're expected to overtake both of these in another two years. So the NDIS is growing and it's growing really, really fast. Um, and with this growth, there's a lot of different actuarial problems that need to be solved. And that's sort of where um, the problem of an actuary comes into play is we're trying to solve um, the sustainability of the scheme and ensure that the scheme functions as it needs to be. So what exactly um, does an actuary do at the NDIS? So I've sort of divided it into four categories. Um, the first aspect is actuaries provide an assessment of financial sustainability and assess the scheme's uncertainty. So the goal of an actuary is sort of to make sure we try and project out the future expenses of the scheme, and we make sure that the scheme remains financially sustainable. Um, and a crucial aspect to all of this is not just projecting out the scheme's uncertainty, but also um, quantifying the level of uncertainty and communicating with it. So it's quite often that throughout your time at university, you're going to be involved in trying to predict and estimate what is called as a best estimate. So you're trying to predict the mean of everything. But once you, once you sort of come into the workforce, a key area of focus is, yes, you are trying to estimate what on average, something is expected to cost, but also communicate the relevant uncertainty around your expectations, because most of what we predict is rarely going to happen. Um, in fact, if you get it, I, predictions perfectly um, correct for all the future years, there's something really, it's not really a prediction. It's more like it's very linear, right? Um, the other aspect is we support the government to implement initiatives. So often, very often, um, the government sort of notices the scheme and they want to make changes and we assist the government and various other organizations in costing out these interventions and providing an estimate as to what this might cost in the future. And finally, um, we measure participant, um, participant and carer outcomes. So this is a concept that's very unique to the NDIS. So unlike a traditional insurance company where you could often ask what exactly is success. So an insurance company might say success is if we make a lot of profit this year, if we gain a lot of market share, and that tends to be very different from the way that we measure success at the NDIS, which is predominantly through participant outcomes. Um, outcomes are sort of what we refer to as participants' happiness slash function, um, a participant's well-being over time. And we have we ask the participants a series of questions to assess where they are and we try and quantify that and we link it to the financial sustainability. And that's really sort of introduced a whole set of new problems, which we're sort of dealing into, which is trying to find a link between um, how much we're spending and the outcomes that are coming out for our participants. So what are the sort of skills that help you as an actuary um, and, and not just in the NDIS, but I suppose I've tried to broaden the whole thing. Um, so the first aspect that I want to talk about is problem solving. Um, as actuaries, we really like our problem solving. So more often than not, it's very rare that two days are going to be the same. You're going to be introduced to a lot of new problems on a daily basis. And the goal is to essentially solve them and try and make sure that things are going well. The second aspect is communicating these problems that you've solved. Um, and this is sort of general dream that all the way from Mike to me, um, all five of us have sort of spoken about this. Um, and it's really important that it's not only the problem that you're solving, but communicating the problem that's being solved. If we fail to communicate what we've done, we're going to get into a lot of trouble. And it's more often not that um, our stakeholders tend to be non-technical. So it's often you could use a GBM to sort of go through the whole thing, which is really complex. And trying to communicate that and explain it to someone so that they trust your model fully and you know provide you with the resources to make sure that things remain sustainable is quite challenging. And that's an aspect that I personally enjoyed over time. Uh, 
and that sort of leads me to stakeholder management. It's quite common that you're going to, no matter where you work, you're going to have a lot of different stakeholders, each of whom want different set of things. Um, so for example, an insurance company, you might have your, um, your policyholders who want to make sure that the insurance company is really sustainable. Um, the shareholders are going to want to make their profit. So therefore you might need to sort of do things and trying to strike a balance between these two tends to be quite challenging. And in the context of the NDIS, the government want to ensure that the scheme remains financially sustainable over time, whereas the disability community, along with our participants, um, we want to make sure that they lead a better life. And you can probably notice that these two don't go hand in hand because one means more expenses and growth for the scheme. And the other sort of means we're sort of tightening up the scheme, making sure that things remain more sustainable um, and trying to strike a balance between these stakeholders and ensure that things sort of function as it needs to be. Um, that's quite interesting and leads to a lot of challenging work. And the final aspect that I want to talk about is thinking strategically and contributing at a broader level. As actuaries, we're not just sort of um, embedded to our mathematics and communicating those results. There's often quite a broad range of things that we need to contribute to. So I think it's really important as an actuary that you can sort of think broadly, contribute to the business problem that's being solved. So in, in for my case, it would sort of ensure that things are working out fine. The media sort of has the right perception. Um, you could publish a number saying the scheme is going to cost X and the media is going to perceive it the wrong way. And you got to sort of deal with these kinds of battles. Um, those kinds of problems are often quite interesting as well. So these stakeholder management, um, communicating results and problem solving at its finest. Um, and that's sort of where I'd like to end my talk. Uh, please feel reach out if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks very much for your and Thanks to all the panelists for giving us a very brief overview. Uh, of where they are in their careers. We do have quite a lot of questions. I've answered some technical type questions uh, as the panelists were talking, but we're gonna open up to uh, the four um, panelists now. And there are many questions, so I do apologize in advance. We've only got about 20 minutes till we close. So we might not get through them all. Um, but here's a, a nice uh, human one. Uh, oh, to the panel. What do you like the most about being an actor? And I, I, I'll shake over to Joy first. Um, being an actor, what I like most is that you get to work with people and you get to do a lot of fun, interesting projects. There's a lot of variety and you can work with people. So you can share this kind of your findings and everything. You're not doing this solo. You're working with a, a team to do it. Thank you. Peter? Uh, I think mine is I like solving solving uh, complex financial problems and uh, getting the opportunity to explain them back in the in a non technical fashion. Cool. Yeah. Uh, fish wash. Yeah, I, I possibly enjoy the problem solving aspect the most. Um, every day is sort of a new challenge where you're asked to do a lot of different things. And again, to sort of echo Peter, uh, communicating those results and trying to make sure that the optics sort of line up is always quite a fun problem. Um, I'm personally involved in publishing most of the work that we do. So as a company that sort of believes in publishing our assumptions, it's quite challenging. Um, and that's something I've enjoyed over time. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think it's being part of a respected profession for those who know what actually actuaries actually are um, and yeah, um, like similar to what the other speakers have said, being able to explain what you've done in a way that really adds value to your client, I think I find really rewarding. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, we've got a good question here. And again, I think um, to get the views of all four of you. What new technologies do you think could innovate the insurance industry? Actually, I'll ask to Ben, Joy and Peter because they're in those areas. So, any one of you? Yeah, well, we we definitely use machine learning a lot in general insurance. Um, it really like, aids what we do, um, whether it's different ways of modeling or kind of improving processes, because um, you'll find that uh, sort of the problems that you get at university and maybe during study are probably not as detailed and difficult as they are in real life. And having, you know, computers and machine learning can really help solve those things, but that doesn't take away from the judgment and the value that an actuary still adds. It, it makes your job easier uh, to some extent. Yeah. Peter? Uh, I'm not on the forefront of AI or anything like that, but I think uh, uh, technologies that would be uh, useful in superannuation is um, with more computing power, it gives you the opportunity to look at things more in real time, where before it might have been uh, you get something uh, a couple of days later or even a few weeks late where 
now it's getting to the point where you can show clients because I'm working in a, a consultancy. You can have something which is sitting on an application for a client and they can, if they have a question, put it into this uh, web interface and it can immediately run what their question is within the bounds of uh, uh, certain restrictions such as uh, this is not financial advice and so on and so forth. But the fact that they can look at things in real time and change things in real time is definitely an innovation that's uh, beginning to take more and more prevalence in superannuation. So, Okay, great. Well, what I'll do now, I'll just ask some other questions rather than ask Joy that one because there's quite a few questions on here. Try and give her as much sort of democracy as possible. Um, what programming languages do you or other actuaries use the most in your job? Would anybody like to have a good answer in that question? Yeah, I might give this a go. Um, so we use a variety of different software. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's software is sort of used as a problem solving tool. So depending on the problem, you often tend to try and find the software that's the most suitable for that. Um, so we often tend to divide softwares into two sections. So one is like your databases um, and software that's used to extract data from your database. And the other one is software that you use for your model. So all the way from Python, SQL, SAS, R, um, every single thing often gets used depending on what kind of place you're working in. Um, and it tends to be predominantly based on the kind of problem that you're trying to solve. So just going back to what I said earlier, um, we use SAS to sort of extract our data out and we would then take the data out and model it in R because we're more comfortable doing that in that particular case. So it all depends on the kind of problem that's being solved. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll pass over to Joy. Um, are there any specific skills or qualities that are highly valued in the actuarial profession? Yeah, definitely the analytical side. We're very detail oriented. We can pick up patterns that people might not be able to see. We have that numerical skills. But in addition to that, um, we have very good communication skills. We're able to say that in a way that's very clear and simple and easy for people to absorb. So having the skills to understand the data and then having the skills to make other people understand the data who wouldn't otherwise. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, I, I can ask Peter, I think you did some mentioned internships. Do you think doing an internship is essential to getting the job in the field? Um, and are you working in a large team or a small team? So it's like two questions in one. Oh, there we go. Um, I would say it's not absolutely essential. I would say it definitely does help. So if you have the opportunity and if you have the time to apply and do an internship, um, I would definitely say go for it, but absolutely essential. I don't think it's going to be, uh, I would say no, I don't think it's going to be a deal breaker getting a, a graduate role and an entry level role. Um, sorry, what was the second question? I uh, lost my work. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> do you work in a large or small team? Uh, do I work in a large or small team? Um, oh, oh, that's a hard one to answer. Well, it's a, it's a broader team where smaller teams work within the broader team. So the oh. people you will work with uh, on, on a project will be maybe two other people, which is a little bit of another perception piece, which I um, found quite interesting working out of uh, going from university and into a role. Uh, in university, I had this perception, especially at the start, where it was quite large teams would work on any given project. But um, moving into the moving into the workforce, it's unwinding that perception and saying, oh, you're working on quite a large uh, project and it's going to be you and maybe three other people. So uh, it's a little bit of a, a perception change, but uh, something I found quite interesting from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to throw it to Ben. Um, how can an actuarial student in her final year prepare to get employed? What skills are a must to have, both soft and technical, as you approach the, the interview stage? Okay. Um, well, I definitely think you should be looking to be doing well in your studies and trying to get most of your exemptions, if not all of them. Um, and I also think it's useful, like Peter mentioned, if you've had some practical experience, but I think more so, I think recruiters probably just want to learn about you and see who you are as a person. Like they want to make sure your culture and values kind of aligns with where they work and you're not just going to be in some back room number crunching because those, I think those days are over. I think actuaries have a much more prominent role now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, here's quite a big question. Um, might be a bit unfair, but let's give it a go. Could you share some real world examples of challenging problems actuaries have solved? 
Um, anybody want to have a go at that one? I don't, I don't know if it's solved, but a topical one would be, and I can discuss it because it's publicly available now. Like the firm I work with, we've been involved with the Cyclone Reinsurance Pool. Um, so what for, for context, um, home insurance can be quite expensive for some people in some areas. That means they can't afford to get insurance. So if a, you know, a big cyclone hits, then they could be left without a home and nowhere to live and no like financial recourse. So that's something that actuaries have been working on for actually over a decade, trying to get together a scheme to help insurance be more affordable for some people. I don't know if it solved the problem, but it's definitely addressed it. Um, yeah, I like that answer, Ben, because sometimes we're not looking for the exact solution for some things because it never exists. It's sort of pathways to get creating a better society. And that's an important one you, you bring up there because uh, the Actuaries Institute, the professional body, one of our main things that we do is obviously education and creating domains of knowledge. But also it's about public policy. How do we position ourselves to make uh, the world a better place? And so that report, the affordability report produced by Finity under the sponsorship of the Actuaries Institute came out a few days ago, uh, created tremendous media attraction. Uh, uh, so the word actually getting quite a lot uh, into uh, the, the, the national press and talking about some real social issues and uh, demonstrating how, how actuaries have a place in certainly um, in, in formulating uh, long-term strategies for, for the um, people in Australia and around the world. So it's great. Um, I, I won't go into it. I'm a bit of a history buff. Uh, actuaries were very much at the forefront of investment world many years ago. Uh, we, we helped sort out the insurance industry. You think about a lot of things. If you didn't have an insurance industry, you wouldn't fly from Australia to elsewhere. It'd be too too difficult for companies to actually transact business. The whole modern world grew up because of the transfer of risk. So there's a, uh, there's a wonderful world book on risk. If you search that on Google, you know, it'll explain a lot of things that happened which had actuaries in the background. Um, anybody got any ideas how to go from superannuation to uh, other traditional actuarial roles like life and GI or potentially the other way around? So you're in a particular domain now. What would how would you go out of your domain into a different one? Uh, anybody got any ideas? No, I can't say I've uh, crossed domains as of yet. But um, on the superannuation side, a lot of the techniques that you learn in superannuation are very similar to that in life insurance. So they're so similar insofar as for the part three courses, or sorry, the fellowship courses as they're called now, they're merged into one course. So there's very similar techniques, for example, um, for a defined benefit scheme after they go into retirement, it's very similar to that of a annuity, which would be provided by a life insurer. So there are definitely crossovers in there. And if you look at the other side of the book and not the liability side, and you're looking at the asset side, you can see things like uh, stochastic modeling, for example, within the asset classes in the investments of the uh, the defined benefit scheme, but that's also more broadly applicable to investments just about everywhere. And to join those two together, there's a you can look at asset liability sorry asset liability management where you're uh, pairing up the two of those, which is uh, something you find across life and GI as well. So I think there's a fair bit of transferable skills within super into other areas, as I'm sure there's other areas and between different areas. I think Joy mentioned earlier about moving between different areas. So I'll uh, let her comment on this as well. Yeah, to um, comment on that as well. Um, basically, when you're moving from industry to industry, some industry specific knowledge might change, but there'll be similar things like you might have similar reserving techniques between general insurance and health you might have uh, pay chain ladder, or you might have a similar kind of insurance structures or operations. There'll be some similarities, but um, going from an industry to another industry is just read up and do a lot of research about the industry that you're getting into, and then um, notice patterns and similarities and talk to people in, in the industry about what they find um, useful to learn. That's quite also helpful. We're just reaching out to other people as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
uh, it's a couple of seconds. So the, this one, uh, what resources or study materials do you recommend for preparing for actual exams? If you're doing the university courses, obviously your lectures, and if you're doing the later courses, uh, the Actuaries Institute has a wonderful set of education materials, which I'm all hoping to see you join as soon as possible. Um, let's think of one for everybody Oh, here. So the question is, what are some potential career paths for actuaries beyond traditional roles in insurance companies? Well, uh, Fishwash has talked about the NDIS, uh, but um, I, I'm going to ask all the panelists to you know, just spend like 30 seconds or so uh, if they can give some input on that question. So I'll jump to uh, Vishwash to begin with. Yeah, um, so I've spoken about the NDIS, but um, I sort of want to go back to the question on superannuation, like um, how hard can it potentially be through? But I think as actuaries, we, we have a set of skills and those skills are often used and transferred across different places. And I'd like to think of a skill set of an actuary of being something like setting up assumptions, trying to look into the future and quantifying that. Um, and I think those kinds of skills are useful regardless of the environment that you're in. Um, just as like a very different example compared to what we've been speaking today, um, I'm currently studying the data analytics subject. And my assignment is about trying to go through tweets and quantifying, like classifying them into the, an appropriate sentiment. Um, that's probably very different from what you've heard us discussing about for the past half an hour or so. And that's very broad. Um, so you can imagine that as an actuary, you're sort of going to be, um, the Institute is really sort of taking up a good stance and sort of trying to expand the skill sets that we have. Um, and I think these skill sets can be tr transferred across the board. Uh, so you'd be surprised in the kind of problems that we can solve using what we know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll pass out to Joy. Yeah, definitely can work in any field, almost any field, I reckon, because we've got the numerical skills and the communication skills. Um, we've got that blend of knowing statistics and probability and the commercial context and also data. So having that blend of this unique skill set, it can be, it's highly valuable and can use anywhere. And I've definitely worked in projects before that are definitely not traditional actuarial, like, you know, frequent flyer programs and um, assessing the uh, liabilities of certain schemes that aren't, you know, traditional, typical, um, you know, reserving pricing sort of thing. So yeah, you can use your skill set in a lot of places. It's more about having the ability to learn and having um, that discipline to to learn um, different um, different concepts and frameworks. Yeah, uh, Peter. Uh, on the point of non-traditional, um, I think, it, well, I don't know if it's right to say, but I'll say it nonetheless, uh, non-traditional, everything was non-traditional at some point. So um, uh, I think anything that has a, a connection to risk or in particular financial risk is the field that actuaries can play in. Um, for example, on the, on the superannuation side where I'm uh, doing modelling for setting up the reserves of superannuation, there's risks in there such as operational risks and how to deal to that. So actuaries are uh, putting their heads together, uh, particularly in the in the uh, oh, through the Actuaries Institute, to come up with solutions to this because this is in the realm and in the skill set of actuaries because it's dealing with financial risk. So I think uh, for me the takeaway would be um, anything that has that attachment to uh, financial risk is a space that actuaries can play in financial risk or uncertainty in financial markets. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the speakers have covered it quite well. Um, I'd say I often work in multidisciplinary teams. So I could be working with a climate scientist, a weather researcher, a data scientist. Um, and I think actuaries have a really good foundation of skill sets that can be used beyond financial industry. So, you know, they can sit on different boards of companies and provide advice. Um, I think it's not just limited to insurance. But I think a lot of actuaries probably continue to work in insurance because they're kind of the subject matter experts there and they probably enjoy it. <laughs> it's taken a while to get where they are. So, Brilliant. Now, here's a question. Which subject have you enjoyed the most and why? And I'll start with Joy. Uh, so I studied um, enterprise risk management and I loved it. I thought it was so interesting how you can conceptualise risk into something that has you know, dollar values or kind of a probability. And then kind of, I looked at it, started looking at everything in terms of like, what's the impact of this risk and how often does it happen? So that was something that really gave me a new perspective. I really enjoyed that subject. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Peter? 
Uh, I would say there was a course in university called uh, risk theory, which was just as it was changing over between the the old part ones and part twos and part threes to the new uh, foundation actuary and fellowship program, where that course I think was a little bit more practical than what I had done before at university, where it was using things like Python and R to come up with uh, the solutions to that. So I think that was my first introduction to um, real world problems and coming up with uh, real solutions rather than just pure mathematical distributions. So I enjoyed that quite a bit. I think yeah. that was one. Uh, okay. Thank you, Peter. Ben? Uh, similar to Peter, I think I actually really enjoyed Control Cycle because um, I think by that time there was so much technical modeling and data. I was a little bit over it. I wanted to see, you know, what more do actuaries have? And I think Control Cycle is a good one where we touched on where we could see, you know, the typical skill sets and judgment that actuaries would get. And you, you had an introduction to that. It's not purely just, you know, statistical theory. Great. Uh, this rush. Uh, I'm going to go with the rather unexpected one and say give up to general insurance valuations. Um, so I did a subject last semester and fresh off the boat. Um, it's a subject that's not necessarily known to be the most friendliest, but I think at the same time, like it's one of those subjects where you really get to explore setting up assumptions, um, using a lot of judgment and combining very technical methods with a lot of actuarial judgment. Um, and I really like one of the quotes that I read in the subject, which is it's the art of actuarial science. Um, you can sometimes think like what what's the logic with art and science going together in the same place it's it's sort of like what we do we sort of come up with a really complex way of defining a problem trying to do everything and we look at the answer and we go oh let's just bump it up by x and then we get a new set of things yeah i like to call that as using judgment so perhaps one of the subjects where i got a lot of freedom to exercise judgment and display the results and things like that so yeah quite interesting yeah. brilliant thank you um there's, there's quite a few questions outstanding i'm just going to Rattle off the final one where there's a question about are there any professional organizations or networking opportunities that aspiring actors should be aware of? Well, this is a great example of a, an opportunity to, to listen. Uh, we have the Sprint application and the Actress Institute website. If you look on there, that's a great place to start your journey. Um, I'm just going to, uh, we're going to close at five. Um, obviously, I want to thank you all for attending, but most importantly, I want to thank all the panelists for um, uh, volunteering their time and their effort, given their stories and all the advice they've provided with us today. And um, finally, we'd like to say that there's a two more seminars in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we hope that uh, you can join us then. So the next one on the 6th of September is about launching your career. And then on the 14th, it's about chatting your career course. Um, with that, we're just running out of time. I just once again, thank everybody. And uh, it will be at some point where we publish uh, this uh, recording of this on our website, or at least the link to it. So thank you and, and goodbye.